The Poisoned City, Anna Clark on the Flint Water Crisis. Hi, everyone. This is great. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to not only um, share uh, sh shared stories uh, here in this wonderful library, but to share it all with you. I mean, this is kind of an exciting day. We did do a pre-launch launch in Flint a couple of weeks ago and gave out a bunch of uh, free copies of the book, but today's the official publication day, um, so it's the first day where it's like a thing, you know, not just a future tense thing, but a present tense thing. So I'm in a great mood, and <laughs> and I'm glad to, I'm glad to be able to celebrate this evening with you. Um, I am sure there are a lot of folks in this room who um, are very familiar with Flint, maybe from Flint, maybe. Um, very much engaged with the issues that uh, come up when we talk about the city and the water crisis. So I am really looking forward to hearing everybody's stories and questions and comments. Um, so yeah, I have a little piece here and, and I look forward to talking. So, um, so Flint. Hey. <laughs> so as many of you know, it's a city of about uh, 100,000 people, an hour's drive north from here. Uh, this, while it's lost a lot of population, it's still the seventh largest city in the state. Um, when we journalists like myself, you know, uh, write stories about Flint, it's often, you know, a chronicle of loss, right? You know, over the past many five decades or so, it's uh, lost people, it's lost business and industry, it's lost public services. Uh, these are all true and important stories, but I think one thing that we erase with that is what is in Flint. So just to orient ourselves a little bit, um, it has a lot of amazing people. It has a city hall that's very distinctive, <laughs> mid-century style with a dome where people gather for public meetings. It's got um, a lovely uh, cafe called Good Beans on Grand Traverse Street that's sort of a community nurse center. It's got this beautiful, airy public library that has wonderful programming of all kinds uh, in the cultural center. Um, over on the north side of Flint, the historic Burston Fieldhouse has uh, been a gathering point for athletes um, talented and un <laughs> throughout the past hundred years. Um, most famously in recent years, uh, Clarissa Shields, the Olympic gold medal boxer, um, it's being revitalized um, by a lot of folks who care about it and its history, and they're doing so in a much more inclusive way than it had been um, in the past. On Sundays, you'll find uh, intramural softball being played all day long in what amounts to a neighborhood festival. It's really fun. If you just go hang out, it's great. <laughs> and Flint, like Ann Arbor, like my own city of Detroit, it's a, it's a Great Lakes town, right? You know, it's only 70 miles from Lake Huron. Uh, the Flint River that courses through it, you know, goes right on up to the Saginaw Bay that, you know, literally defines Michigan's shape. Uh, for uh, about 50 years, uh, Flint was, um, drawing its drinking water from Lake Huron uh, through the Detroit Water Department, um, which uh, served it well in many ways. The water quality was good, but it was, it was also, um, there was a lot of rising pressure in the community about uh, prices. The water was, if not the most expensive water in the nation, it was among the most expensive water in the nation. And that's especially a burden when we're talking about a city that has about 40% um, a 40% poverty level right now. So you can imagine, right? Um, there's some other issues with this that I'll get into in a little bit, but uh, short story is, um, after uh, the long-term contract expired, Detroit uh, or Flint uh, decided it was gonna join this new water system, a new mid-Michigan regional water system, also drawing from Lake Huron, called the Karagandi Water Authority the KWA, and it wasn't even built yet. It had like two more years to go. Um, and uh, for some reason, a reason that um, is being investigated thoroughly to, right now, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the city under state appointed emergency management uh, opted to um, uh, spend the interim two years drinking water from the Flint River that was treated at its rebooted city water plant instead of just continuing to pay its bill with Detroit and get water from there. So you might remember some of this. <laughs> um, it was really celebrated. It was People were so excited about it. They were like, we are like reclaiming our sovereignty. We're getting back to our roots. 
Uh, you can see here in um, the images, uh, the emergency manager at the time, the mayor, uh, city councilors, uh, people with the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, um, having this like celebratory event in April 2014 where they turned the water off from Detroit. Um, and uh, the editorial board of the local paper, um, a lot of other residents, you know, thought um, this might be good. You know, there's, it was very controversial, but, you know, some people were in support of it. Um, this brings me to one of the myths about the water crisis. Uh, there's a, one, things that, one thing I hear a lot is that the, you know, the Flint River was toxic, that it poisoned people, it, was, it made people sick. Um, it is true that the Flint River was terribly polluted and mistreated throughout much of the 20th century, um, especially when, oh my gosh, I did the same thing. <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't open it. <laughs> um, the, yeah, so it was, mis it was mystery, especially when General Motors and other industries were at their peak, right? And we didn't pass limits on what you could just dump in the river until the rise of the environmental movement in the 70s. So, um, so the stories that people were hearing about the Flint River, like avoid it, don't drink fish from it, don't swim in it, um, were based in real experiences. Um, but after a couple of generations, really, with uh, um, the environmental regulations in place and with a similar amount of time with deindustrialization, far fewer factories, far fewer people, you know, pouring in their pollution into the river. It's much healthier now than it's been in a really long time. And that's also with the help of um, community groups like the folks here, the Flint River Watershed Coalition, who caretake it, clean, do cleanups, do things like this. So it, there's still some issues with the river, but it's not the river itself that is the problem. It is how the river water was handled. And so what happened was that, um, you know, what your, the, the water plant was not, did not receive the upgrades it needed to treat the water properly. River water is inherently more complex than to treat than lake water. Um, and also, most ominously, the, uh, the water did not have something called corrosion control added to it. So this was breaking federal law. Corrosion control is what you're supposed to do, um, or supposed to add to water to help keep the, um, Keep the, keep the water clear as it passes through all the pipes, water mains, service lines, and infrastructure. Um, it's not just an issue in cities like Flint. Um, even in wealthier communities, we have uh, disinvested in our infrastructure for a very long time, um, deferred maintenance. There, you know, we have pipes that are 60, 70, 80, even more sometimes years old. They're falling apart, right? And corrosion control, when you add it to the water, um, can help you know extend the life a little bit of the pipes. It helps it be the wa drinking water um, be safer when it by the time it comes out of your tap. So in Flint, as you might expect, when you're treating um, when you're using a water source that is more corrosive as the river was, and not using corrosion control, you're going to corrode pipes, and that's what happened. <laughs> These are actual pipes that came from Flint. So when folks, you've seen images of people holding up like gallon jugs of discolored water, that's corroded iron. That's like literally like rust, right? Um, lead, which we is of course the most famous problem with uh, Flint's water, is invisible, but since there's lead pipes, that was also corroding um, into the water. And lead is one of our most well-known neurotoxins. Um, it is, uh, it's something that you absorb into, first, it, it gets into your blood and then your bones and tissues, and there it stays, kind of like calcium, you know? It's, um, it's, this is why um, when people talk about it, they talk about how it is, it's very, um, toxic consequences are incurable um, because it stays with you. And children are most vulnerable to it because they're developing bodies, their bones are growing, their tissues are growing. Um, so we clearly have a crisis, right? Um, and one that gets worse the longer we wait. Oops. Yeah. Okay. So um, it took, I, I, in brief, you know, it took about 18 months of community organizers, um, uh, uh, you know, researching the problem, protesting the problem, really using every means possible to make themselves visible and heard, even in a city that did not have the power of its local vote at the time. This entire time, is, it's all unfolding under emergency management, which means um, that a state-appointed official is in charge of all the decisions, and the mayor and the city council don't have the authority of their offices. 
eventually, you know, and with the assistance of like, you know, some, you know, outside professionals who helped do some independent testing, the state did concede that it was a citywide problem. And after a few more steps, um, there was this full-scale emergency response and national horror, right? And you're beginning to see these kind of images all over the community. That's a short story. <laughs> I'm going to back up a little bit um, and talk, go back to Flint in the 1960s, which is when it signed that contract with Detroit. Um, it signed the contract with Detroit because it um, felt like it needed a new water source, one that was, um, could help sustain it as it grew ever larger in population and industry. The city had been, um, the, 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 the industrial sector was still more or less at its peak. Um, the city's population had been just like growing by leaps and bounds, you know, including, um, you know, a large scale uh, migration from the south of folks looking for these jobs, looking for these opportunities. There was a lot, um, besides the jobs, there was you know, a lot to boast about in Flint. It had one of the strongest middle classes in the country. It was famous for it. Probably had something to do with the union movement that was very alive. At the time, it had a nationally renowned community schools movement um, that made schools you know, really like you know, neighborhood centers, you know, um, serving not just the children, but the adults. Um, it also, yeah, so it's, it thought it was going to like just grow, 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 grow. We need to hook on to a bigger water system. Um, it's a little haunting to remember that because that, that was exactly at the point where the city was peaking. Flint also had an African-American mayor, what I believe is the first African-American mayor of any major American city. Carl Stokes in Cleveland was elected some years later. Floyd McCree was appointed. Um, and he had a role that was a little bit more like a city council president, so it's different. But it did make headlines um, all over the country at the time. He was a World War II veteran. He worked at a um, Buick foundry um, in the city. He uh, got coverage in places like Jet that were like, ooh, you know, man in the office, man in, you know, working um, in the industry. Uh, this was uh, particularly significant because Flint was one of the most segregated cities in the country. It was, at one point, it was the most segregated city in the north and the third most segregated city nationwide. Um, and, you know, and there was only two neighborhoods where African Americans were allowed to live. That was St. John's, where the mayor lived, and Floral Park, neighborhoods that do not exist today because of highways and so on. Um, so this segregation was enforced, you know, through means I know a lot of you are familiar with, you know, like uh, racist federal lending policies and insurance policies, racially restrictive covenants where you couldn't sell a home to a person who looked different than you. Um, um, even if you had, um, you know, like a system that was set up so that if somebody, if a, if, a, if, a, if a black person like bought a home, it was worth less the second they signed the papers. Or if even you bought a house that was like near, you know, like too near, you know, like an African American neighborhood. Um, there was also the plain old tactics of intimidation. I was reading some oral histories and there's, you know, folks who would work with a white ally to sort of subvertly buy a home in a different neighborhood, you know, the white person would buy the home and then immediately sell it back, you know, sell it to the, the real buyers. And then you would find things like the school district, you know, sort of just immediately reshifting the lines, you know, to kind of keep the segregation present, um, you know, eggs on cars, just like, just everything you would expect. And it's horrible. And especially as the population of African Americans is growing in the city, and you only have these two neighborhoods, conditions are getting worse and worse and worse. There's predatory rents, you know, and um, um, other pricing, you know, in these communities that they're getting like, um, you know, dirtier, crowded, you know, like the infrastructure is not being invested in. And uh, folks have, you know, had it. <laughs> so there's this like fair housing movement that's like rising up in the city that the mayor was very supportive of. Um, now this brings us to July 1967. So as everybody I'm sure knows, uh, 50 years ago that, um, about almost exactly 51 years ago, um, <laughs> the, the city exploded in what was the most infamous of insurrections um, in uh, urban centers in the nation. You know, it, by the end of it, after about five days, there's more than 40 people who were killed. 
many, many, many who were injured, or more than 2,000 buildings that were burned. It was um, a, re the real, a real, like, a deep low point um, and caused, it ended up sparking a lot of, you know, federal reflection and so on. Um, the, uh, what I think is less well known is that the same week Detroit was on fire, so were many other cities around Michigan, from Grand Rapids to Pontiac to uh, Mount Clemens, Ecorse, Benton Harbor, um, over where I grew up. I mean, it was just, it was like a spark, right? You know, and these like, there's been really a lot of the same concerns in all these same communities, and people are showing up in force to make themselves heard and visible. Um, in Flint, there was a fair housing rally in North Flint, right near where those so that softball stadium was. It had died down, and there was a few young folks who stayed behind, started throwing things and setting things on fire. That's what started things in Flint. The mayor and the county prosecutor, um, even in the midst of a state of emergency and national guards and all, all these things closed and so on, um, put together a really controversial deal. The 102 people arrested the first night were freed with no charges on the condition that they go keep the peace, that they go out and patrol streets and, you know, kind of, you know, encourage their peers to, you know, stay calm, you know, and, and um, will work to get this fair housing ordinance back, you know, you know have, the, have the city commission vote on it finally. And what's wild is that it worked. It totally worked. It, um, in Flint, the, uh, the, the riot like died down after two days. There were no deaths. There were no serious injuries. There was property destruction. Um, but it was very different than what was happening, you know, an hour's drive away in Detroit. Uh, and the city commission did agree to, um, to take out this fair housing ordinance once again. Uh, well, not once again, for the first time. They'd been delaying, delaying, delaying. <laughs> um, the mayor makes this like tearful plea. He's like, I'm a veteran, my brother's a veteran, we fought in World War II, our father fought in World War I, and we come to this community and we can't like buy a home wherever we, um, wherever we wish, you know? Even when he has this like city civic post, what happened is unfortunately is that it was voted down five to three, and he, at that very meeting, he's like, I can't even do this anymore. He's like, I'm appointed to this position less than a year before. Everybody's like, you know, real proud of how progressive they are, you know, made a lot of headlines and so on. He's like, and this is his quote, you know, like, I cannot continue living this equal opportunity lie, and he quits. And a lot of other people started quitting with him, uh, black people and white people um, in civic posts started getting attention in like the national press, this like, you know, this uh, new sort of urgency that was coming on to this fair housing question in Flint. Uh, the mayor, um, under suffering like exhaustion and ulcer, he was hospitalized pretty shortly after, and his 23-year-old nephew comes to visit him. It's a nephew named Woody Etherly. And he, uh, like, while they're chit-chatting, um, his nephew comes up with this idea for where to go next. What, he's, what we're going to do, he says, is we're going to have a sleep-in on the lawn of City Hall. That's what we're going to do. And they did it. <laughs> they, you know, all these young folks, like, bring out their sleeping bags and their, and their pillows, and they're like, we're going we're gonna to stay here until there is a reconsideration of this fair housing ordinance. And they did stay there, um, despite sprinklers being turned on, despite, you know, the intimidation of you know, patrols on the roof of City Hall. This is that same building that has that dome. Um, it, it got a, a great deal of attention, including um, a s segment on the Huntley Brinkley Report. <laughs> um, it, uh, there was a, a couple of hundred or so people, I think, ultimately, who participated in this. Somebody was making them breakfast every morning. Um, and uh, th they also had the support of um, um, even... Uh, you know, a lot of state officials, too, including the governor at the time, George Romney, a Republican, who was a supporter of the mayor. Um, this organizing tradition didn't come out of nowhere. Um, I, um, Flint, of course, is famous for the sit-down strike in the 1930s uh, when, um, you know, uh, workers in the General Motors plants occupied three different factories in Flint in the city where General Motors was founded um, at a time when it was really one of the most powerful companies in the world. And they brought it to its knees, <laughs> you know, they, they stayed even though the heat was turned off, they um, were, um, they didn't leave until they got um, a new, um, the right to collectively bargain, effectively creating the United Auto Workers, 
um, and changing the course of the 20th century, um, but also you know, better work conditions, better wages, things like this. So this is like deep in the DNA, I think, of Flint. Uh, the sleep-in uh, participants were also supported by a 5,000 uh, member rally, unity rally, that came to Flint um, in support of the mayor and the demonstrators. Um, the governor, George Romney, and the attorney general at the time spoke at this. You know, we can see we're really, you know, this is really escalating here. And the com city commission agrees, finally, to reconsider this fair housing ordinance. The mayor returns to office. He, um, it's a watered down version, but the good news is it passes. Barely, but it does. <laughs> but, but, within seconds, like, well, okay, minutes, opponents are like, no, <laughs> we're going to start a referendum and, and overturn this. Um, so there is this whole movement of people who started gathering signatures and rallying. This, is, had, in, this group included at least 50 known Ku Klux Klan members. Right, and a, me a, and a member of the John Birch Society, they had a literal, a literal parade down Saginaw Street, you know, you know, robed and all, um, and they did get enough signatures to get this on the ballot to overturn this fair housing ordinance. So the mayor's like, oh. um, <laughs> he takes a leave from his job at the foundry to um, join this interracial coalition that was like trying to get voters to um, come out and support it. And in the, had the vote in February 1968, and it passed actually by 30 votes after the recount. 30 votes, 40,000 voters in one of the most segregated cities in the country. This is a huge deal. Flint was the first community in America to pass a popular housing vote by, or pass a fair housing vote by popular um, vote. So similar votes had come up in Seattle, uh, Tacoma, Berkeley. Akron, Toledo, a number of other places, voted down. Um, a national fair housing ordinance at the time seemed like it was, you know, it was sort of similarly being delayed, 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 and it was never going to happen. That changed, you know, within a couple of months after the death of Martin Luther King. But at the time, that nobody knew that was coming. So this was a huge civil rights victory. And Flint, Flint of all places, was really a national leader on this. But... It's a little bit bittersweet. This happened in 1968, that vote. Within two years, the US census marks the first downturn in population for the city. Um, and uh, you know, there had been, this is incentivized by the growth of the suburbs, um, you know, supported by a lot of federal and state policies that are, in my view, actively working to dismantle core cities. And then in the wake of um, um, civil rights laws, fair housing and school desegregation, people white people, middle, upper class, lower class, you know, start leaving town. Um, today, Flint is about the same population it had in 1920. It's uh, less than half the population it had in Mayor Floyd McCree's day. And that population is about 57% African American. Now, this all comes back to the water story. So in Flint today, you'll still see very dense neighborhoods with really beautiful historic homes, you know, like that uh, folks have been, um, you know, caring for, maintaining, loving, have a lot of tradition there. Um, you're also going to see a lot of um, vacancy. That reminds me of, you know, the city where I live in, in Detroit. Um, these are the remains of the people who left, right? You know, like there's... Um, when you have less than half the population you used to have, you're going to have a lot more empty space. Uh, this directly connects to the infrastructure question. The infrastructure didn't shrink along with the population, right? So you have far fewer people and far poorer people um, paying to maintain a water system that's not only meant for twice as many people, but also those huge industrial plants. It wasn't just residents who left, right? Um, it, the math is just not going to work out, you know? And even though even before we get into how the water was mishandled, that switch to a new water system is not solving the real structural issues for how, um, for why, for why that water was so expensive, right? And we're also setting up a situation where, you know, I mean, Flint was like losing like 40% of its water through through leaks, you know, and it's much more expensive to fix that after it happens, and it doesn't. But like, where's this money going to come from, right? You just it, it was in a tough situation. It is in a tough situation. Um, it also made the water quality literally worse. So when you have those corroded pipes, 
um, and um, and they're passing through like long stretches of vacant land, you know, or under some vacant houses or a big empty factory property. It sits longer, right, in the in in, in the in the um, in the infrastructure, so it has more time to get concentrated, right? So so if you're in a neighborhood that is has a lot of vacancy and is probably poorer, you're more likely to have discolored water. Um, uh, I, I have some friends who lived in like denser neighborhoods who were equally affected in a lot of ways by the water crisis, but were less likely to have like visible problems because the water is moving through a little quicker. Um, this is also why there was flushing campaigns in Flint, like turning on hydrants to just like spew the water out. And even for a while, um, you know, a campaign that was advertised on local TV and so like everybody turn your water on like five minutes every night, everybody do it, you know, because they're trying to get the water moving. Um, and eventually, once they reconnected to Detroit's water, trying to kind of repair some of that uh, corrosion. Um, but like I mentioned, we're, we, a lot of the same structural issues are still there. Um, I don't think this should be a surprise um, when we concentrate our poverty in certain places, um, when we concentrate our vulnerability, we shouldn't be surprised that, that those places and those people are therefore more vulnerable. Um, this shouldn't mean, this shouldn't, um, I don't want people to go away thinking that, um, well, there's this unusually, an unusual perfect storm in some ways that happened in Flint that the rest of us are completely immune, you know? Um, we're all connected, uh, not just through our waterways and our infrastructure in so many ways, but um, through our, uh, um, um, through the fact that we have, you know, for example, aging infrastructure and a specifically lead-based infrastructure all over. I mean, that was just like what people use. In Chicago, it was mandatory up until 1986. And there, there is some debates about that right now. <laughs> so lead's, of course, a threat in, in, in house paint, um, in our soil, where like fumes, for example, from leaded fuel from decades didn't just disappear, it's still like around. That's why in a lot of places you, you have to test for soil before you test the soil before you garden. And then also in our drinking water, um, there's a lot of, the Flint story did reveal, I think, a lot of loopholes in how we test our water everywhere. Um, the same folks who are responsible for a lot of this, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality is responsible for our drinking water if we're in Ann Arbor or Detroit or any other place around the state. Um, so. I'm, one of the things I'm trying to do with this book is like, on one hand, say like, here's this, here's, here's, this, here's something that happened in Flint, and in so many ways, even more than the obvious, it was a man-made crisis. Um, and if we don't take responsibility for that, we should expect it to happen again. Also, I don't want to, while some things were unusual there, I don't want us to like sort of have this sort of false comfort that that's only what would happen to those people, right? You know, so we'll just leave that there. Um, oh, and the, the last, the other myth, another myth I really wanted to make the point of is that the people in the city were not just like victims just waiting to be saved. You know, they were agents of this the entire time. Um, in 2014, in 2015, in 2016, people were not just um, protesting, but they were lobbying, they were researching, they were, um, you know, making themselves experts on water treatment. Even before they knew really what was going on, they were doing everything they could think of to document what was going on. And this was happening in a city that did not have, again, the power of its own local vote. Um, it just, it's uh, something that, you know, the rest of us can reflect on why it, it takes us a while to hear that and take that seriously. Um, also, they've been caretaking for each other um, in so many ways, you know, doing bottled water drives and sharing information, um, going back to literally just within weeks, months after the water switch when people could tell something was off, even if they didn't quite know what it was yet. Um, and to this day now, um, the Flint's uh, is back on Detroit water. There are a number of questions and issues people have. The corroded pipes are in the process of being replaced, but that won't be finished until about 2020. The state did, um, in April, decided it was going to uh, stop doing bottled water distribution in the city, so the residents are kind of back to doing that on their own because a lot of them don't quite trust it yet. Um, and that's the Flint River. And that's my story. <laughs> this program was recorded on July 10th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.